We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Holy Mary, our hope, seat of wisdom. Did everybody get a handout? If not, share. There are 24 handouts circulating. If there are more than 24 people, you will need to share. One of you is studying at the column there. That is already more interesting than the talk. That's not a good thing. All right. So we have the whiteboard here, which I will use from time to time in case there's anything that needs to be illustrated. Now, Holy Week is already upon us. It came very quickly this year. I'm not sure if I'm the only one who feels that way, but it's a very quick Lent. There's this little flyer that you can get upstairs, the Holy Week ceremony, because I think that I was debriefing today with the seminarian at lunch about whether my announcements in the last few weeks were sufficiently clear and charitable, so I hope they were gentle pieces. They're definitely, definitely very clear. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, Holy Week is not something we do because it's not sort of ritualism or formalism. We do it because it's a nice dramatical presentation, and we all enjoy that, and we have nothing better to do. Holy Week is the most important time of the year, so you have that flyer. You can adapt your schedule to it. Originally, I had the idea... We would talk about Holy Week in general, on the approach of Holy Week, the ceremonies in general. It became very obvious that that would <laughs> require more than an hour-long conference, um, especially if you know tendencies to go off tangents, things like that. So what, what we might do, if I'm here again in the future, which of course we never know what's going to happen, is that this year we'll talk about Palm Sunday, next year we'll talk about Holy Thursday and Good Friday, because they go together. In fact, uh, the ceremonies of the Triduum are, are not mandatory, they're not holy days of obligation anymore, they were until 400 years ago. So a church could have the triduum, right, most churches do, but if you have Holy Thursday, you must have Good Friday. If, you, if you're going to have the ceremony of Good Friday, you must have the ceremony of Holy Thursday, whether or not you're going to do the Easter Vigil. So the Holy Thursday and Good Friday go together, and then a year after next year we'll talk about maybe the Easter Vigil. But today we mostly want to talk about Palm Sunday, because it's at the beginning, but for reasons you'll also be clear, it also it, it contains in it mystery of all the mysteries of, of Holy Week. Okay, so this is called the Hidden Treasures of Palm Sunday. We have two parts tonight. The first part will be probably a little bit shorter. Part one, the spirit of Palm Sunday. Part two, the liturgy of Palm Sunday. So in this first part, I just want to make a few general remarks about the spirit of the liturgy in general, then the historical event of our Lord's entry into Jerusalem, and some things that we should bear in mind, and then a very brief sketch about the liturgy of Palm Sunday, how we got the Palm Sunday that we have, and how we get you know, our Lord of the Last Supper didn't hand out to the apostles a missile. The liturgy is something that developed, but it developed around the kernel of these historical events. So, this week that's about to begin, we call Holy Week. But in fact, the liturgical books themselves, they call it the Hebdomada Maior, the Great Week. St. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople, one of the Eastern Fathers of the Church, says, We call it great not because it has more days than other weeks or because its days have more hours, but because of the number and greatness of the mysteries we celebrate therein. For it is in these days that the devil's tyranny was destroyed, death was disarmed, sin and the curse were taken away, heaven was opened and made accessible to man, who because of this became the equal of the angels. Its fasting and vigils are also longer, its offices more numerous. So the greatness of this week, the great week. That point that he mentioned about man becoming the equal of the angels Something you can bear in mind when we talk about the ceremony of Palm Sunday that takes place at the church door. So, often non-Catholics have the idea that the church's liturgy, particularly when they see it deployed as it's meant to be, 
correctly in the full traditional forms, beautiful music and architecture, investments, everything. They think it's just meant to impress. It's just some sumptuous affair that the church has created to wow people, right? To impress upon the majesty of God. That's not exactly true. That's true in a subsidiary sort of way because everything that touches worship of God should be beautiful. That's how our soul is brought to understand his majesty and so forth. But the, the point of the liturgy is to offer fitting worship to God. So the primary purpose of, of the liturgy, the liturgy is the worship of the church. More specifically, the liturgy which Christ, the God-man, who is the head of the church, renders the Holy Trinity. The purpose of the liturgy is to give glory to God and secondarily to sanctify man. Right? This happens through the Mass, which is the centerpiece of the Catholic liturgy, through the divine office, the sacraments and the sacramentals, the various blessings of ritual, and the liturgical year. And in a certain way, you could think of the liturgical year as being analogous to architecture among the arts. Right? It's architectural because it, it includes all the other arts. It has sculpture, it has construction, it has uh, all the other arts are marshaled into its service. In the liturgical year, you have the mass, you have the divine office, you have processions, you have all these other parts of liturgy which are combined into a harmonious cycle. And the purpose of all this, St. Paul says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So in order to render to the Father worship that is pleasing to him, our Lord said the Samaritan woman, God seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth, we need to conform our mind to that of Christ. So in the sacred liturgy, and that's one reason why we have the liturgical year, that's why there's not just a standard beige mass that's offered every day the same. The reason we have the liturgical year is so that we can participate, and we'll talk about that word in a moment, so that we can participate in the sentiments and the acts of the will which our Lord had in his human soul when he was accomplishing on earth the mysteries of our redemption. Blessed Columba Marmion, who died 100 years ago, says in one of his books, we know that it is especially by the liturgy that the church brings up the souls of her children in order to make them like unto Jesus and thus perfect the image of Christ, which is the very form of our predestination. Pius X. He says, filled as we are with a most ardent desire to see the true Christian spirit flourish in every respect and be preserved by all the faithful, we deem it necessary to provide before anything else for the sanctity and dignity of the temple, in which the faithful assemble, for no other object than that of acquiring this spirit from its foremost and indispensable font, which is the active participation in the most holy mysteries and in the public and solemn prayer of the church. That is why we go to church. Right? Now people go into churches for all sorts of other reasons, secular reasons, church has become a sort of meeting place, but the church exists for the solemn worship of God, and it is by participating in the church's worship that we acquire the spirit of Christ. So what is participation? That's a word, when, when we talk about the liturgy now in the church, the word participation is sort of a buzzword, and in people's minds it means doing something. You know, <laughs> I remember one time uh, when I was home on vacation, the, the local parish priest kindly gave me a key, and I could say daily mass there, in the little chapel. Um, now my parents kindly built a little altar at home, so that's more convenient. But I would go to the church and, and say Mass, and you would take the time to set up, put everything away afterwards. And on one particular day in the week of this parish, they have adoration in the chapel, so I had to say Mass at a different time than usual. And the day before, the nice elderly lady who was the sacristan there was telling me, oh no, when you come to say Mass tomorrow, there'll, there'll just have been a ladies' guild meeting, so can I tell the ladies that you're going to be saying Mass? And they could come. I said, oh yeah, sure, that's fine. So I, I planned ahead and brought some missiles with me because, you know, people who are not used to the traditional Mass, you hate for them to be completely lost. And so I was speaking before Mass to a little lady at the back of the chapel showing her the ribbons and the missile, and she sort of shook her head and apologized. She said, oh, I'm sorry, Father, I have a sore throat today. I can't do the readings. <laughs> so, <laughs> even though this <laughs> was a traditional Mass, it was a quote-unquote private Mass. I'm not saying that to make fun of anyone because, of course, she was actually trying to be kind. But... The point is there's this notion so ingrained today that if you have to be at Mass and get something out of it, uh, you have to be doing something. Or not, it, may, it might be even not just that you to get something out of it have to be do doing something, but for it to mean anything, you have to be doing something. There's another, this is not me, who's involved, another priest was telling me a story that, obviously in the context of the new rite, for some reason the lector didn't show up who was going to do the readings, and so uh, the sacristan was very worried beforehand and who would do the reading. The priest said, well, don't worry about it, I'll just do the reading. And she said to him, Oh, you can do that? <laughs> so, so there's this notion of participation 
which is activism. You have to be doing something. Well, that's not really what the church means by participation. St. Pius X, when he talks in this document about it being through the liturgy, the active participation in the holy mysteries that we receive the indispensable source of Christian spirituality, participation, we think of it in a more theological, philosophical sense. I'm going to read to you here now a definition from a book of spiritual theology, and we'll talk about what that means. Participation is the assimilation by an inferior thing of some perfection existing in a superior thing. Right. So, a being that has a lower degree of perfection can receive within itself some perfection that belongs by nature to a higher being. Okay, that still sounds very abstract. Okay, imagine a uh, if you've ever been one of those historical reenactment villages where they have an ironmonger, right? Actually, they still have ironmongers, not just historical recreations, but Imagine you're watching them make the horseshoe. You have a piece of iron, right? In its own right, it's just an inert thing. It's plunged into the forge. What happens to it? Well, it doesn't become fire, right? It's still what it is. It's still a piece of iron. But it receives, in keeping with its own nature, a perfection belonging to the fire, right? It's, it gives off light. It glows. It's hot. So it participates in the fire, right? So the whole Christian understanding of sanctity means that we are to participate in God's own inner life. And in heaven, that's the whole point. You'll see God face to face. St. John says, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. In other words, the reason we will be like him completely is because we'll be doing what he does. So the nature of a thing is what enables it to do what it does. In our theology talks, you've heard this concept very often. This is one of the major differences between Catholicism and Protestantism. Right? That for Protestantism, uh, justification is just a legal concept. God knows that you're wicked and guilty, but instead of looking at how horrible you are, he thinks of Christ and, and he imputes the justice of Christ onto you. The Catholic notion, which is the biblical notion, is that God's grace truly transforms us, that we share in God's nature, and in heaven we will be like him because we'll be doing what he does, which is to know him and love him directly. Right? So participation is a very, very high elevated concept. It's not just a question of carrying something up to the altar or doing something in church. It's a question of joining yourself, which is primarily a spiritual reality, to that act of worship by which Jesus Christ, God made man, gave to the Father pleasing worship while he was on earth. So this is what participation in the liturgy means. And the liturgical year is a particularly favored vector of participation because it brings before our eyes and into our souls and hearts one at a time the mysteries of Christ, which he lived on earth. So to participate in the liturgical year is a cornerstone of authentic Catholic spirituality. Now I'm going to read to you a passage from Pope Benedict XVI. In the year 2007, he issued two important liturgical documents. I hope you all know what one of them was. Summorum Pontificum, right? The Emancipation Proclamation. The other one, which was uh, applied more generally to the liturgy, is a document called Sacramentum Caritatis, in which he exposes the theology of the liturgy, but also he sets down some practical norms and guidelines. Uh, I want to read to you the paragraph where he talks about what's called mystagogy. Mystagogy is a word that comes from the ancient church fathers. It basically means the, the study of the, of the mysteries, right? It's the explanation of the meaning of the church's worship. Right? And he's saying that you know, one reason people are not participating fruitfully in the worship of the church is because there's an inadequate mystagogy. Nobody knows what's happening. Okay, this is what he says. Now, I want to make a caveat before this that you've all heard of probably the liturgical movement, right? About 100 plus years ago, uh, at the beginning, the idea was the liturgy is this great treasure, right? Suffice so 10 to participate in the liturgy as a means of sanctification. And at the beginning of the liturgical movement was the idea was this is a very sacred thing. We should do it well. We should build beautiful churches. We should revive the sacred arts that even the way a missal is bound should be beautiful. We shouldn't just have a 35-minute low mass on Sundays, we should recultivate the high mass, the Gregorian chant should be back, put back into honor, the processions, the Sunday vespers, and so forth, not minimalism. So the idea that we, need, we have this treasure, we're not using it enough, we need to get the Christian faithful to participate authentically in the liturgy, i.e. the liturgy that we have. So that was a good idea. As it went on, some of the movers and shakers of that movement started to emphasize all the things the liturgy could do, how it could be a tool for evangelization and so forth. Again, that's not wrong. But that which is secondary to liturgy started to become more important in their minds. And if that's the case, if it's a useful tool, then maybe it would be a more effective tool if we changed it and made it more accessible. So it sort of 
derailed. So here when he's talking about how the liturgy can be useful, we have to bear in mind what that means really, that that's, the liturgy isn't meant for something, it's not primarily something that we use for something, even for evangelization or whatever, but above all it's to draw us into the worship of God. God is always primordial. He says, by its nature, the liturgy can be pedagogically effective in helping the faithful to enter more deeply into the mystery being celebrated. That is why, in the church's most ancient tradition, the process of Christian formation always had an experiential character. Right? In other words, like Aristotle says, you become an ironsmith by ironsmithing, right? not just by reading a book about it. Uh, and so, although cate- this is one thing you hear a lot of today, right? catechesis, we need better catechesis. There are a lot of good Catholic lay people, priests, bishops, who realize that the church is not very healthy right now. The, the lived experience of the church is not healthy. And so that's why they have this very expensive Eucharistic uh, revival or whatever it's called. And the refrain you keep saying is, well, we need better catechesis, better catechesis, better catechesis. Uh, that's true, but it's not just handing out catechisms, having glossy flyers and nice DVDs and things. You also just seeing the way that the church worships should itself be, that's what he talks about, the experiential character. So imagine, for example, if you were to have a church where every week there's a good Orthodox sermon about the real presence and then communion is distributed the way you see it in churches. Well, you have a church where they never talk about the real presence, but communion is distributed the way you're used to it at a church like here. You know, imagine a non-Catholic walking in and asking them, what do Catholics believe about the Eucharist? Well, even if they couldn't hear or understand a sermon about the Eucharist, the fact that they see everybody fasting for many hours, they kneel down, only a, a celibate man wearing special vestments is allowed to touch the host, uh, the other priest who comes out of the sacristy healthy is to wash his fingers off whatever he does, so the experience of the liturgy, right? That itself, it is pedagogical. It's, it's the, it does teach us but it's not gimmicky, right? Authentic liturgy that derives from the lived experience of the church is not gimmicky. It's not something that's really made up to get some point across. It reflects the faith of the church inherently. Okay. So we continue now with this quotation. He says, While not neglecting a systematic understanding of the content of the faith, i.e. teaching, it's centered on a vital and convincing encounter with Christ as proclaimed by authentic witnesses. It is first and foremost the witness who introduces others to the mysteries. Naturally, this initial encounter gains depth through catechesis and finds its source and summit in the celebration of the Eucharist. This basic structure of the Christian experience calls for a process of mystagogy, which should always respect these elements. He lists three. I'll mention two of them that are relevant right now. First, it interprets the rites, R-I-T-E-S, in the light of the events of our salvation, in accordance with the Church's living tradition. The celebration of the Eucharist in its infinite richness makes constant reference to salvation history. In Christ, crucified and risen, we truly celebrate the one who has united all things in himself. From the beginning, the Christian community has interpreted the events of Jesus' life and the Paschal mystery in particular in relation to the entire history of the Old Testament. Secondly, a mystagogical catechesis must also be concerned with presenting the meaning of the signs contained in the rites. This is particularly important in a highly technological age like our own, which risks losing the ability to appreciate signs and symbols. More than simply conveying information, a mystagogical catechesis should be capable of making the faithful more sensitive to the language of signs and gestures, which, together with the word, make up the rite. So that's what we're doing tonight, a mystagogy of the Ceremonies of Holy Week, because in a church building itself, there's great symbolism, even to the parts of the church, in just a normal mass on, on just a normal day where there's not a particular liturgical solemnity, the mass itself is full of symbols and gestures and meanings. All of this is consecrated, concentrated to an extremely high degree during Holy Week. Right? Holy Week, uh, the ceremonies of Holy Week, it's hard to, probably for me, Palm Sunday is still my favorite day of Holy Week, uh, but it's hard to pick because each of them is, I couldn't say one is more beautiful than the other, each one is what it should be, right? St. Thomas says that part of beauty is its proportion, that everything is in its place. Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Day itself, they're also completely different from each other, uh, and in so- some cases the ceremonies are so completely unlike anything else that you'd see in a Catholic church in the course of the year that without, you would be impressed by it, right, uh, but without understanding a bit about the symbolism of it, we would be sort of dumb spectators, right? So again, participating doesn't mean that you're doing something, but it means that your intellect is activated in the sense that you understand at least some some degree what's happening in the church. Again, even a non-believer or an uninformed Catholic can be impressed by the beauty of these ceremonies. They're very archaic. They're very, they clearly communicate the holiness of these days. Um, to 
allusions that both came to my mind now, they're from two different novels of Evil and Law. In one of them, in Brides That Are Visited, um, the daughter of this Catholic noble family is trying to explain to a, a non-believing family friend uh, things about the faith, and sometimes in a comical way, but uh, their family chapel is being closed by the bishop, who's not going to allow that anymore. And she sings perpetually like Good Friday now, the tabernacle's empty, and he t she quotes a uh, line from the Tenebrae of, of Holy Week, where the prophets, uh, prophet Jeremiah, the lamentations about the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, uh, Quomodo said it sola civitas, how the great city sits solitary that once is full of people. And she says, you have to come to Tenebrae sometime just to hear the chant, so beautiful. And then in another one of his um, war trilogy stories, uh, man gets up early on Holy Saturday morning to go to the Eastern Vigil just to hear the exultet, because it's so beautiful. Beautiful when the deacon is able to sing it, because it's a very difficult piece of music to sing. So even if you're not a believer, just the beauty of the ceremonies can be uh, impressive. Uh, and sometimes that can spark a conversion, like the, the poet um, Piggy, his conversion was sparked by the, the beauty of a liturgical ceremony he was attending. But we want to be more than just outward observers. Okay. So Pope Benedict here says that the sacred liturgy often uh, presents to us under symbolic form the mysteries of sacred history. And of course, that is all the more true, more than at any other time during the year, in Holy Week. Right? We're living almost hour for hour our Lord's final and most important days on earth. So sacred history has three main phases. So there's a line in St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans where he evokes three, I'm sorry, Epistle to the Hebrews, he evokes three big concepts. There's the shadow, the image, and the reality. The reality is heaven. God himself unveiled the Trinity whom we hope to see forever. The heavenly realities. The image of these realities is the New Testament. Right? The sacraments, the life of the church, which make present to us now the grace that will lead us to heaven. The shadow of the image, that's the Old Testament. So, I don't know if this was in his mind, but has anybody ever read, read the Allegory of the Cave? Read the Allegory of the Cave. So, it's, it's a sort of, it's pre-Christian. Uh, it's sort of an apology for, for the life uh, that seeks after wisdom, right? Even in spite of the difficulties of mockery that might come to the world. And so you have these people, they're, they're in a cave, and they're chained to the wall, right? They can't move their heads at all. And they're looking at the wall of the cave, sort of like a movie projector. And behind them, there's a, a light source, a fire, and there are different puppeteers making shadows that are cast on the wall. So their whole life, they just see these shadows. They think that's reality, right? And a lot of them, one day, manages to break free. And then not only does he see the figures that are actually causing the shadows, but eventually gets out and sees what the world is like. So it's not only that he has seen a shadow that looks like a tree, then he sees a puppet of a tree, and he goes out and sees a real tree. The same sort of thing here that we have now, we're living in the present time, we experience the grace that Christ won for us in the past, and it's an image of the heavenly reality to come. The Old Testament was simply a shadow of the image. A shadow of the image. So we have these three main moments of sacred history. Even the Old Testament, you know, that's not the point of this talk tonight, but you could divide the period of the law of nature, the time of the patriarchs, then the law of Moses, or the, the giving of the law is a big turning point in the history of Israel. Here's a quotation from St. Thomas Aquinas about how our worship, i.e. the liturgy, relates to this dynamic of salvation history. He says, external worship should be in proportion to the internal worship, which consists of faith, hope, and charity. Consequently, exterior worship had to be subject to variations, according to the variations in the internal worship in which a threefold state may be distinguished, right? This picture on the diagram here. One state was in respect of faith and hope, both in heavenly goods and in the means of obtaining them, in both of these considered as things to come. And such was the state of faith and hope in the old law. They didn't yet have the realities brought by Christ. Another state of interior worship is that in which we have faith and hope in heavenly goods as things to come, but in the means of obtaining heavenly goods in things that are present or past. And such is the state of the new law. The third state is that in which both are possessed as present, wherein nothing is believed in as lacking, nothing is hoped for as being yet to come, and such is the state of the blessed. Our liturgical ceremonies call to mind certain events which now are past, and which themselves foreshadow future heavenly realities, and which cause the graces we now receive in the present. So particularly, now you can 
see that many of the basic ceremonies of Mass every day, but particularly at a time like Holy Week, this is sort of on overdrive, that the ceremonies are highly symbolic, that they're not just impressive or beautiful rituals, a procession just for the sake of procession, no, they, they all mean something, and they call to mind often a past event that itself foreshadowed something in the life of Christ, which itself promised us a heavenly reality to come. So we'll talk about some of these ceremonies that we see today we're talking about Palm Sunday. Okay, so symbolism. A symbol is a sign which joins some perceptible reality to a higher one that we do not immediately experience. Right? You see that in the sacraments. A, a, a symbolon was a sign or a token by which something was inferred, sort of like an ID card emblazoned the insignia of the club. The catechumens, right, those are those who were training to be Christians, they were going to be baptized at the Easter Vigil, they received a symbol, a token that inferred their faith, so that when the moment of baptism came, they could show the faith with which they were seeking baptism, sort of like a sign and countersign in which two people identify themselves to each other. It comes from a Greek word, symbolon, to cast two things, to put two things together. So in the case of a symbol, as we have in liturgy, you have two different realities joined together. One, the liturgical rite that you're participating in, and then the heavenly reality that is the counterpart of that. Now, our liturgical rites, they're very symbolic, right? That's why they seem quite unusual during Holy Week, because it's the one time a year you see such or such a ceremony. Uh, were they invented to be symbolic? Right? Did St. Leo the Great or St. Gregory the Great or Charlemagne or whoever sit at his desk one day and say, let's make up a ceremony that will represent such and such a thing? Uh, gen generally not. Um, many of the liturgical ceremonies both those on special occasions like Holy Week or those just of normal Mass, they started out for a practical reason or a historically verifiable reason, and that original reason might have fallen into disuse, but the practice of the Church is never to jettison any of her customs that is it's not harmful, and the Church wouldn't have a harmful custom, uh, but they can be given a symbolic meaning afterwards. I'll quote to you here a book by Father Thurston, who's a Jesuit in England, who on the whole likes to seek for very rational explanations of things. He's not into sort of excessive symbolism, but he does say the symbolism of any rite depends not upon the fact that it was designed with a mystical intention by its first inventors, but only upon this, that under the providence of God and with the tacit approval of the church, a certain meaning has become attached to it in the minds of the faithful. So for example, at Mass, you know, you see that at the elevation, for example, the server or the deacon lifts the back of the priest's chasuble, right? Historically, there was a reason for that was that chasubles used to be extremely large, made of heavy fabric, and for the priest to list, lift his arms safely to elevate the host of the chalice, he needed help. So they would pull back the chasubles so that his arms were free. Chasubles over the centuries, they got smaller and smaller. I don't know, maybe fabric got more expensive. The priest does not need help to move his arms now during Mass, but that gesture still is in place, and it's seen as a sort of symbolic allusion to uh, the woman in the Gospel who touched the hem of our Lord's garment to receive his power. Right. So at the moment that most powerful moment of the Mass when the translation occurs. You have the deacon or the altar boy representing the church touching the chasuble, the hem of the priest's garment, to receive the, the graces. Right? So that's, that's not why it happened originally. It's a historical, practical reason that no longer applies, but now there's a symbolic uh, level super added onto that, which is perfectly legitimate. Right? So that's how symbolism often works in liturgy. So our Lord's own entry into Jerusalem. You can read the Gospel, St. Matthew, chapter 21. Of course, there are analogs in the other Gospels. We're looking at St. Matthew chapter 21 because this is the passage which is included in the liturgy of Palm Sunday. Okay. At that time when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem and was come to Bethphagia and to Mount Olivet, then he sent two disciples, saying to them, Go ye into the village that is over against you, and immediately you shall find an ass tied with a, and a colt with her, a child. Loosen them and bring them to me, and if any man shall say anything to you, say ye that the Lord hath need of them. And forthwith he will let them go. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Meet thy king, behold thy king cometh to thee meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the fowl of an ass, she that is used to the yoke. And the disciples going did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the ass and the colt, and they laid their garments upon them, and made him sit thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut boughs from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So that's St. Matthew's account of the first Palm Sunday. So on Palm Sunday, we have a procession carrying palms. We are reminded of this past historical event. It happened once. It didn't happen again. 
you were reminded of it. The liturgical, quote-unquote, reenactment of that event and that event itself also have a deeper spiritual meaning, which we're going to talk about. But for now, we just want to remind ourselves of the historical event, which on this particular day of the liturgical year is recollected, our Lord's triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which becomes one of the dramatic preludes to the Passion, right? Because then his enemies are angered right, about his influence with the people. So it's a memory, an important turning point in the life of the Lord on earth that the church wishes to recall. Even on that historical level, the Palm Sunday is extremely meaningful. You could you could simply read the different accounts and, and then read them in parallel with Old Testament passages that illuminate them. So although there is debate about the chronology of, of course, at different points of our Lord's life, and particularly of the Holy Week, uh, it is generally accepted that Palm Sunday happened on the 10th day of the month of Nisan. Right? It's nothing to do with Japanese cars. The Hebrew calendar has different months. It's a lunar calendar. The month of Nisan overlaps with our end of March, beginning of April. So our Lord entered Jerusalem on the 10th day of the month of Nisan. Okay? That is the day, according to the book of Exodus and the law of Moses, when the Passover lambs, which were going to be eaten by each family, had to be brought into the home, into the encampment, whatever, at the time of Moses, there was not yet the temple. Right? They didn't yet have the holy city of Jerusalem. Solomon built the temple. Uh, they had a portable temple. It was called the tabernacle. Right? It had the same architecture of the temple, but it was portable. It had an uh, outer courtyard. It had the holy place, and it had the holy holies, and all sorts of regulations you can read about, about how to pack it up and set it up as the camp moved. But the 10th day of Nisan, that's when your family would bring in the lamb that it was going to slaughter for the Passover. And you had to have at least 10 people. If you didn't have enough people in your family, you'd have to pass over with your neighbors. All these regulations had to be an unblemished male lamb. We will be blessing an Easter lamb. There's in the Roman ritual a blessing of the Easter lamb. Ours is not um, spotless, we'll say. You know, we, <laughs> so I thank the parishioner who very kindly went all the way to New Jersey to get a lamb for us. This is a good start, so we'll have the blessing of the Easter lamb. Uh, the Easter lamb was crucified when it was cooked. That it, in order, uh, it, its legs were spread out, and so it was cooked on two different spits. Right? So it's crucified to be cooked. So there's already great symbolism there. But so on the 10th day of Nisan, usually when you think of Palm Sunday, you think of our Lord, the disciples, the cloaks, the children singing to him. Probably the streets were full of lambs, right? Because uh, Jerusalem, the, the holy place, was a site of pilgrimage, as it is now also, of course. And... Passover is one of the three major times of the year when if you lived within, it's an earshot of Jerusalem, it's not really the right word, but if you didn't live in the, you know, in the diaspora of Egypt or whatever, if you were, if you could, you, you would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So you had to get the lamb, there was all sorts of market for lambs. So the lambs on the 10th of Nisan are flooding Jerusalem. They're going to be taken to the places where the different families will be observing the Passover. So nowadays, you know, there are different ways to tag a lamb, you spray paint it with different colors, things like that. Uh, in those days, you would have, uh, because the head of each family had to host the Passover dinner again for 10 people, so maybe him, his family, maybe the neighbor's family as well. How are you going to identify your lamb? Uh, it would have a placard hung around its neck with the name of the father of the family. Okay. So probably, as our Lord is coming to Jerusalem, these lambs are all over with these. Now, there is a lot of debate about <coughs> the day on which the Passover happened in the year in which our Lord died. A debate whether... Uh, the Last Supper of Holy Thursday was an, a proper, you know, Levitical Passover meal that the Passover lambs had been slaughtered earlier that day and that it, the apostles and our Lord were observing, as it were, a normative Jewish Passover, or whether the Passover lambs were being slaughtered on Good Friday at the same time that our Lord was crucified, in which case the Passover meal that our Lord celebrated was not the legal uh, Passover meal that it was anticipated, and there are different theories about why that may or may not have been the case. I don't want to go too deep into tangent on this, but it is interesting. And again, as Catholics, we have to reaffirm the absolute inerrancy of Scripture. So there are four main theories about how the different accounts. So you have St. John, and the other three Gospel writers are often called the synoptics because they tend to tell the same order of events and things like that. And according to a lot of scholars, there is an apparent contradiction between the chronology of St. John and the synoptics about the relationship between the Last Supper, Supper and the slaughtering of the Passover lambs that year in Jerusalem. One theory is that St. John was right and the synoptics were wrong. Another theory is synoptics were right and St. John is wrong. So as a Catholic, you can cross those two theories off because neither one of them is wrong. Mm -hmm. Other theories relate to you know, different sects within Judaism, different calendars. Maybe pilgrims were given some leeway, things like that. Um, we can be assured of the fact that there is no contradiction. Um, St. John Christum, St. Thomas Aquinas, they seem to uh, be of the view that 
the lambs were slaughtered on Thursday, and that the Passover meal was a true Passover meal. Um, the line in St. John that makes people a bit confused is that the Jews, they don't want to go into the courtyard of the of Pilate because they'll be defiled, and they because it's pagan, and they cannot eat the Passover, right? Um, but in reality, Passover has a much larger, uh, more elastic meaning, just like Easter. Easter is the day of Easter. It's the octave of Easter. It's the whole season of Easter. Uh, you know, you have the duty of your Easter communion in French. It's called Fer c'est pas. You have to do your Easter. You can do it any time during the Easter season. So the, the Passover um, of the Jews also was a Passover week, and there were certain ritual meals each day of the week, and any one of them uh, had to be in a state of ritual purity. And so, and particularly that year with the coincidence of the Good Friday was the day of preparation for the Sabbath that fell within the Passover week. So it was also a very sort of a uh, conglomeration of important Hebrew liturgical events. Uh, so again, there are different Orthodox Catholic interpretations of these facts, but it does seem likely that um, the Passover they're referring to was simply one of the other ritual meals that week and that the official Passover had, in any case, Either our Lord was crucified at the same time as the Passover lambs on Good Friday, or at the time that he instituted the sacrifice of the Mass at the Last Supper, the last licit Passover of the Old Law had been celebrated that day, and meaning that the one celebrated in the Temple the next day was already displeasing to God. It was already no longer the work of a true religion. Um, why am I telling you all this? Because think back about these lambs that had the um, placard around their necks with the name of the head of the household, in the Roman justice system, when they were leading particularly heinous criminals to be crucified, you had to know the charge, right? You knew all about the superscript. And again, different Christian artists of the centuries have imagined these things differently. Sometimes you see our Lord going through the streets of Jerusalem carrying the cross, and you have a soldier on sort of a stick holding the superscript with his crimes. But generally, and I think maybe even Mel Gibson's movie might be this way, that they would have it, the charge written on a placard hung around their neck, right? And you know that. Uh, the charge against our Lord is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. In the different Gospels, the exact charge is slightly worded differently. Again, doesn't mean there's an error. Remember, it was written in Greek, in Hebrew, and in Latin, and each of them gave the essence of it, but perhaps there was a little distinction in how it was worked in each one. But one theory is that in the Hebrew version, and we can't confirm it because in the relic that they have in Rome, at the Biscuit of the Holy Cross, uh, the Hebrew portion is not still on there, but Hebrew being read in the opposite direction to our words and acrostics being very important Hebrew, you know, the, uh, the first letter of each word, it is thought that the Hebrew charge against our Lord spelled out, in fact, the initials of the name of Yahweh, right? So you have the lamb wearing the name of his father as he's led off to his execution. Um, anyway, so that's just one significant element in the date of, of, of the Palm Sunday. The, the lambs were brought for slaughter to Jerusalem, okay? Under that, for that last Passover under the old law. Okay, so the liturgy of Palm Sunday, as I said, the liturgy developed over the centuries. All right, a big turning point was the peace of the church. Constantine, he legalized Christianity. Now you can build big churches. You can go outside to celebrate. You can have processions. So the liturgy developed a lot of that. One of the oldest accounts we have of Palm Sunday is from a, an abbess named Sylvia, or Etheria, who in the 4th century went to Jerusalem for some months, and she uh, left an account of the different ceremonies she saw there. So she gives an account of Palm Sunday in Jerusalem with the Bishop of Jerusalem, and how the people there, of course, the Christians of the Holy Land, they could recollect these events in the places where they happened. Right, And that's one reason later on we had the Stations of the Cross, is that the Crusaders would come back to Europe and talk about the holy places they visited, and they would try to recreate them in their own church or in their churchyard. So that's we had the Stations of the Cross developed much, much later on. Um, and so people like Sylvia who would go to the Holy Land and see the liturgical events there would go back home tell people about it and there would sort of be an adaptation in Europe of the rites that developed in a kernel form in the Holy Land and so there was first a gathering at Mount Olivet and then they would sort of reenact the procession of our Lord and then it seems reading between lines that there probably were two masses that were offered on Palm Sunday the first mass included a blessing of the palms and there was this long procession not <laughs> five minute long procession a long procession and then the patriarch would celebrate another mass at the end. Um, when the Pope in Rome would celebrate Palm Sunday, again, it seems that this was the case. There was first uh, what was called a station. So they'd meet at one church, which was St. Mary Major, right, which is the church where the relic of the crib is kept. 
And then there would be a first mass celebrated there in the presence of the Pope. The palms would be blessed. There would be a procession to the Lateran, which is actually the Pope's cathedral. St. Peter's is not the Pope's cathedral. Later on in the Middle Ages, for practical reasons, the Pope said, well, you know, we'll keep that rubric in the Missal, but I'm too tired to go to all these places, so we'll do it at St. Peter's. We'll just stay here. And the palms were blessed at this first mass in a, a church called Santa Maria in Tori, which actually was, was just a, a large chapel attached to St. Peter's. <laughs> it's not very far away. It was in the atrium of old St. Peter's. They, they, they destroyed old St. Peter's to build the one you see now. But in the Missal, it still mentions the old station church. Uh, in many other parts of Europe in the Middle Ages, there were extremely elaborate um, versions of the Palm Sunday procession. The Blessed Sacrament might be carried, relics, the Gospel book, there'd be an elaborate ceremony in the churchyard. Um, the version that we have in our Roman Missal, uh, when Pope Pius V standardized, he didn't create, he didn't make up a new mass, but St. Pius V in 1570, he standardized and promulgated our Missal. After the Council of Trent, right, he asked different scholars to go through the sacristies of Rome and the library and find the best manuscripts they could. The, in the 1300s, after the schism in Avignon, the popes were exiled, and so many of the old ceremonies that were over, without all the processions to Rome and things like this, they were curtailed. And then when the popes came back to Rome, we had what was called the Curial Missal, basically the liturgy as we celebrated the papal court. Right? These are people who are very, very busy. They're not monks whose main job is the sacred worship. They also have bulls to write and cases to judge, and so there was a, a sort of streamlined liturgy, the curial liturgy, the liturgy of the Pope and his cardinals and bureaucrats of the Vatican, um, and that's what was standardized in the 1570 Missal, so it doesn't have a lot of the very florid editions that many places would have had in the Middle Ages. But nonetheless, even in this form that we have it in the Roman Missal, the liturgy of Palm Sunday is very elaborate compared to the sobriety that normally characterizes the Roman liturgy, and probably these ceremonies that we're about to describe um, came via Gaul, what we now call France, that had what was called the old Gallican Rite, uh, came via that place from the east, right, from the Holy Land, from the, the Byzantine Rite. And then it was preserved as the liturgy we now have in the Roman Missal. But then that brings us to the point, I said, we have this in the Roman Missal, but some people don't have this in the Roman Missal, because as we went from the early church, the sober early Roman Rite that then time of Charlemagne, the emperors wanted to show their unity with Rome, to adopt the Roman rite, so it took the Pope about 100 years to have the copies made. It wasn't the same Pope at that time anymore. Sent copies of Charlemagne. They also liked some of the customs they had north of the Alps, and they sort of fused together by the time the missile got back to Rome. Exile of Avignon, fast forward, after the Council of Trent, all of this was standardized in one book that we have the Roman Missal. And then that lasted until the current day, where some of you may be aware there is also a new form of the liturgy that's used in many places. That happened in 1969. But before that, there were already initial reforms who, uh, in retrospect, were simply a step to the completely new liturgy that was created in 1969. So in the 1950s, Holy Week was reformed. Right? The rest of the Missal on the whole was not touched, but Holy Week was changed. Other things that are less um, strike would be less striking due to changes in the calendar and the way that feasts and Sundays overlap and things like that. But in 1951, a new ceremony for the Easter Vigil was created at Experimentum. In 1955, all of the ceremonies of Holy Week were reformed. Okay. And Pope Paul VI in 1969, when he, when he made the new Missal, the Novus Ordo, he said, the beginning of this renewal was the work of our predecessor, Pius XII, in the restoration of the Paschal Vigil and the Holy Week Rite, which formed the first stage of updating the Roman Missal for the present-day mentality. Right, so it's sort of a confusing line, because one he's saying it's a restoration, on the other hand, it's updating the missile for the present-day mentality. I'm not quite sure what that means or how those two things are compatible. But on the question of fact, he's certainly right that the 1969 New Mass didn't just <laughs> didn't just drop out of heaven, now it's obvious. But uh, it didn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, it was prepared, right? The reform of Holy Week was sort of a trial balloon. One of the priests who, who created the New Holy Week, right, he described it in his words, the head of the battering ram which penetrated the fortress of our hitherto static liturgy. He meant that as a good thing. So the, the reform of Holy Week would be the first step. Uh, that's why, in a certain sense, the 1962 Missal that you hear, hear a lot about, because it's the last edition of the Missal from before Vatican II, uh, in some ways, particularly during a time like Holy Week, it's not traditional Missal, it's transitional Missal. Right? From 1955 to 1969, that's just 14 years, right? So the idea is, if you're going to use 
and participate in the traditional liturgy, which is all of the treasures that it represents, uh, it doesn't really make sense to sort of hold on to your dear life to a form of liturgy that lasted for 14 years. Right? So Holy Week uh, that we're describing today is the form that it existed in for many centuries before the 1950s, right? so it's the time you, the form you would find in any Roman Missal from before the 1950s, different from what you would find in 1962 Missal. Many of the changes that they made in Holy Week anticipate changes that were standardized across the board in the Novus Ordo ceremonies facing the people. Right? In the new rite of Palm Sunday, they put a table in the middle of the sanctuary. The priest stands there to bless the palms. Use of the vernacular in the new Easter vigil, right? this renewal of baptismal promises. Uh, the people joining in prayers formally reserved to the priest on Good Friday in the newer rite. People say the Pater Noster with the priest. Right? Whereas from the time of Gregory the Great onwards, it's clearly explained that the Pater Noster is the conclusion of the canon. It's a priestly prayer in the context of the Mass. So a lot of these things are trial balloons uh, for the rest of the Novus Ordo. Okay. That's just a historical note. I'm not saying that to be polemical. The main point of this talk is not to compare the two forms, but just to explain why it is that there are now three different forms of Holy Week right, in the Western Church. The traditional Roman form, the interim trial balloon form that you have in the 1962 Missal, and then the Novus Ordo. Actually, the Novus Ordo Holy Week uh, undid some of the reforms of the 1950s, like the Easter Vigil, uh, which we're not talking about today, but has 12 readings. They cut it down to four readings in the 1950s. In the Novus Ordo, they put it back up to, set, to seven, at least, so that some of these very important Old Testament prophecies that were cut, they at least put back in. So some of the things that even are even better in the Novus Ordo Holy Week than they are in the middle Holy Week. Okay, the Liturgy of Palm Sunday. Three parts here. There's the Blessing of Palms, the Procession, and then the Station at the Church Door, and finally the Mass of Palm Sunday. Is there any question up to this point, anything that was not clear? Yes? What about the 1965 Mass? Uh, in, in terms of Holy Week, I don't think there are any big changes between, but I'm certainly not an expert on this question. Uh, <coughs> you know, so you know that at Vatican II, the first document that was signed, the Sacrosanctum Concilium, is about the liturgy, right? It gives certain principles of the church of theology, many of them very beautiful, but then it sort of recommends reforms. Uh, it doesn't directly pass laws about reform, but it says that after the council, this will be entrusted to some sort of committee. That document is, is full of very reassuring statements. You know, Latin is a normative language. Gregorian chant should have pride of place. There should never be any innovation unless it, it uh, is absolutely demanded. In other words, this principle of St. Thomas and you have in Plato that there should never be a change of any law unless it's for something that's much better. Simply changing a law in itself is destabilizing. So you have all of this, but then there were sort of vague statements like... Um, there could be more radical reforms. We'll have to wait and see. That's a paraphrase. Only four bishops voted against Sacrosanctum Concilium. Right? 2,000 plus bishops voted for it because it was such a reassuringly worded document. Nobody there imagined that it was going to lead to uh, communion in the hand and we're going to make up new Eucharistic prayers. Nobody imagined that there was going to create a new liturgy out of nowhere. They thought that there would be some minor reforms to the liturgy that existed because the liturgy, as I said, our Lord did not give the apostles a missal. The liturgy has developed over the centuries. Um, in fact, one line in this document, it says that certain elements of the Roman liturgy that had been lost to the accidents of time could be restored. But if I were a bishop of Vatican II, I'd say, yeah, well, like that old holy week we just got rid of 10 years, 10 years ago, maybe, maybe that's what you would which is put that back. So almost all of them voted for it. Archbishop of Hever voted for it. He was very enthusiastic about some of the changes that were promised, because remember, he was a missionary, had a very practical notion of the liturgy. So he, I read an article that he wrote in 1965, very enthusiastic about the fact that vernacular was going to be used in the Mass. Nobody thought a new mass was going to come out of Vatican II. And so in 1964 and 1965, they did reform the liturgy, the existing liturgy, in keeping with the recognitions of Vatican II. Uh, people could have different opinions about that. In 1969, they did not reform the liturgy. They made up a completely new one. So, uh, you know, when people say, well, you know, why don't you accept the uh, liturgy reform of Vatican II? say, well, okay, why don't you? <laughs> you know, if... When you start exclusively celebrating the 1965 Missal, then we can have this conversation, but I'm not saying that that should be our goal, the end point. Um, but the 1965 Missal, right, there are questionable things about it, but it is the old Missal reformed. It's not a new Missal like the new Missal is. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious, yes. you made the battering ram comment. Father Carlo Braga. Okay. Yes. That, that black book that you had to offer for Holy Week? Yes. Is that... Pre correct. And that's the one we're going to use. Correct, correct. Okay. Right. I, I wouldn't have sold you something you couldn't use. It would just confuse no, you. No. <laughs> we're selling this so that you have something you can follow along, and so we don't have to print hundreds of copies of a little booklet. <laughs> See? Okay. So we can make a marginal profit by selling you this book. <laughs> 
All right. So if you have this book or a missile with you now, you can follow along some of these we're going to talk about. So the Liturgy of Palm Sunday, we have the Blessing of Palms, the Procession, and then the Mass. The first thing is that if you've been to Palm Sunday in the Old Rite, or the Interim Rite, or, or the New Rite, you know, the Blessing of Palms is very, very different. In the Novus Ordo, the Blessing of Palms and the Mass are celebrated in red vestments. In the Old Rite, everything's in purple vestments. In the Interim Rite, it starts out in red and it switches to purple. Um, we talk about procession, we'll talk about how that is an unprecedented thing in, in the history of the Roman Rite. But the very, very striking thing about the old rite for Blessing Palms is it looks like a mass. If you didn't know any better, if you've only been to the old mass a few times, you come Palm Sunday, by the time you get your palm, you think you've been to mass. Right? It's, uh, there's an intro it. There is a collect. There's an epistle, gradual, singing of the gospel. Uh, if you come to a solemn mass version, or at least a high mass version, all the ceremonies, incense, candles, you have the deacon singing the gospel and everything. Uh, there is... Um, a preface, like at Mass, there's the Sanctus is sung, and then another prayer, and then several prayers the priest says, and then you get your palm. So it looks very much like a Mass. Probably the reason for that is, again, uh, we don't have clear, exact historical records of what Mass was like, or Holy Week was like in the year 300, or 400, or 600, but probably there was this first Mass for the Blessing of the Palms. This is something that happened a lot in the history of liturgy, that certain feast days had multiple Masses. Christmas now is the only one that still has multiple Masses, three different Masses for Christmas. But the Feast of St. John the Baptist used to have two different Masses. Holy Thursday had three Masses. You had the Mass at which the bishop blessed the holy oils. You had another Mass for reconciling the penitents. Right? On Ash Wednesday, the grave public sinners who were exiled from the church, they were reconciled at a Mass on Holy Thursday. And then finally, the third Mass in the afternoon or the evening, you had the Mass of the Lord's Supper. Right? Eventually, especially as the ceremonies of the liturgy became more developed, it took longer to celebrate Mass, Celebrating three pontifical masses like that in one day could be a bit exhausting, so they all merged into one. So that before the reforms of the 1950s, which quote unquote restored a chrism mass, uh, the bishop of a diocese on Holy Thursday would celebrate one mass in which he would also consecrate the holy oils. Now, both in the 1962 form, which one diocese in the world does use on Holy Thursday, and in the Novus Ordo, they have two masses. They have a chrism mass where the holy oils are made, and then they have the mass of the Lord's Supper. So in the history of the liturgy, there were times when there were multiple masses, but the tendency was to eliminate that. But probably this Mass for the Blessing of Palms is a, is a remnant of that earlier Mass before the long, long procession, and then the other Mass at which the bishop or the pope would, um, would celebrate. So this first Mass, we, it's called the Dry Mass. And Misa Sica, that was also something done in the Middle Ages for devotional reasons. The Carthusians of the present days think still do it, where they would say the prayers of the Mass, but without the consecration, because you can't offer multiple Masses a day simply for devotion be a sort of spiritual gluttony, but they would offer more than one Mass but without the consecration. So the dry Mass means a Mass without a consecration. But as I said, this Mass for the blessing of palms, it looks like a Mass. Even the five actual prayers for blessing the palms that come after the Sanctus, they sort of mimic the structure of the canon of the Mass. Right? Uh, and in the early centuries of Christianity, again, we don't have hard copy books, so some of this, is, that's why you should always be very wary about when a liturgist goes, well, the early church, they did this, so we have to restore it. You know, a lot of the reforms of the 20th century are now based on what we know to have been bad scholarship. So you have to be very modest in claims about the ancient liturgy. But it seems that the material goods that people would bring to Mass for the clergy, for the poor, not just cash, uh, some of these things, food, oil, would be blessed during the canon of Mass. And there's the line of the canon of Mass, Perquim Hegumnia, through whom all these things are blessed, right? So that uh, it's possible that palms at this first Mass were blessed at this point in the canon of the Mass when other earthly goods were brought to church to be blessed. That's very speculative. After the palms are blessed, you receive your palms. It's like coming up for Holy Communion. There's another prayer. It's like the post-communion. And, and the deacon says, let us proceed in peace. It's like the dismissal. So you more or less have all the structures that correspond to a normal Mass. But Mass hasn't even started yet. You have a procession, and then you have Mass, a very long Mass with the Passion. So this definitely got the axe when the reform came in the 1950s because the reformers said this is completely bloated useless medieval pageantry you're making a sacramental you know we've all made sacramentals you bless a rosary in the sacristy you make holy water these are nice prayers it's a palm you don't have a whole mass just to bless a palm why have this huge involved ritual just to produce a sacramental that's a very misguided view of the thing because the ceremony for blessing palms isn't simply a ceremony to make a sacramental. It's the opening act of all of Holy Week. Right? The blessing of palms, the first ritual gesture of Holy Week, is not standalone. And we don't have time to investigate every single correspondence, but somebody could write a thesis about 
the ceremonies of Holy Week and how they're interconnected among themselves. Right? It's, a, it's a coherent whole. For example, in the Roman Rite, it's the only rite of the church um, in which all four passions are read spread throughout Holy Week. Right? So there's a sort of unity, even though the passion did not happen on Palm Sunday or on Holy Tuesday or Holy Wednesday. Uh, it did happen on Good Friday. We also read the passion. We read the passion on these four days of the Holy Week. Uh, the colic that's said at the beginning of Holy Thursday, it's also said after the first reading on Good Friday. Uh, one of the readings from Good Friday is repeated again at Easter Vigil, the post communion for Easter Vigils, post communion of Easter Sunday. There are all these connections. Holy Week is a big integrated whole, each part of which is extremely unique, but it's a whole. It is a ritual and theological whole. So the blessing of palms at the beginning of the week, it's not a standalone set piece. It is the opening act of this whole ritual drama, which makes present, symbolically and sacramentally, the mysteries of our redemption. And since the mystery of our redemption is summed up and indeed represented in the Mass, it makes sense that this opening act of Holy Week resembles a Mass. So, to me, the dry Mass of Palm Sunday is, is one of the greatest treasures of the Roman liturgy and one of the most inexcusable reforms, um, a reform that happened you know, 10 years before Vatican II. Okay. We could just look a little bit about at, at some of these things. Again, I don't want to keep you here all, all night. The collect. So there's an intro at the collect. O oh God, to whom above all, uh, to whom to love above all is righteousness, multiply in us the gifts of thy ineffable, ineffable grace. And since thou hast given us in the death of thy son to hope for those things which we believe, grant us in the resurrection of the same to attain the end to which we aspire. So already this opening prayer of the Blessing of Palms is already talking about the death and resurrection of our Lord and the fruit that it will bring to us, right? So it's already an ark covering the whole of Holy Week. Then there's this epistle which is read. Now, in some of the research for this talk, I read some articles, chapters by some of these liturgical movement scholars of 100 years ago, and already sometimes you can see that the spirit is not that great. One of them talks about the sort of bizarre and meaningless ritual, and this epistle that I'm going to read you from the book of Exodus, right, uh, it mentions palm trees. So, well, of course, you know, they had to pick something to talk about palm trees, so it's just a random idea. I'm going to read to you this epistle, and then it's not me who's invented this. Other people have seen these things, and others, such as myself, have profited from their insights. This epistle that's read during the dry mass for blessing palms is, in a certain sense, the key to all of Holy Week. And this, this even good holy men who've written some of these articles I'm referring to 100 years ago, they say it's sort of a bizarre and meaningless choice of a reading. In those days, the children of Israel came into Elim, where there were twelve fountains of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped by the waters. And they set forward from Elim, and all the multitude of the children of Israel came into the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, the fifteenth day of the second month, after they came out of the land of Egypt. And all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, said to them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat over by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full. Why have you brought us into this desert that you might destroy all the multitude with famine? And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Let the people go forth and gather what is sufficient for every day. He's talking about the manna. That I may prove them whether they walk in my law or not. But on the sixth day, let them provide for to bring in and let it be double. To that they were wont to gather every other day. And Moses and Aaron said to the children of Israel, In the evening you shall know that the Lord hath brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. And I'm probably going to forget some things, because now I have so many papers here marked up. I'm just going to try to, from memory, prompted by this reading, to tell you some of the mysteries that are contained in it. So first of all, you have the mystery of numbers. You have 12 and you have 70. Remember this diagram here of the logic, the dynamic of sacred history, the Old Testament, the New Testament, heavenly realities. So you have 12. You have the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, the 12 foundation stones of the heavenly city of Jerusalem. You have 70, the senate of 70 men who advised Moses. You have the 70 disciples of our Lord. Uh, water in scripture is extremely symbolic, but our Lord talks about uh, being a fountain of living water, representing grace. Palm, the palm is a sign of victory. Um, the wisdom books of the Old Testament talk about the just man who shall flourish like a palm tree. Now, yes, probably this reading was chosen on Palm Sunday because it mentions palms, but there's a lot more to it than that. The murmuring of the Jews against Moses and Aaron, they were so happy to leave. They've been freed, finally. <laughs> After 400 years of slavery, they're freed from Egypt. They're delighted. They get into the desert, they start complaining, well, at least we had food to eat in Egypt. Okay, what happens on Palm Sunday? Hosan to the son of David, we're going to throw our cloaks on the ground, we're so happy, you're going to be our king. 
Five days later, crucify him, crucify him. All right, so you have this quick change of heart on the Hebrews in the desert, the murmuring against Moses and Aaron, figuring the murmuring of the chosen people against our Lord during his passion. Right? You have manna. Is there anything during Holy Week remotely important related to manna and what manna foretold? Right? The manna, the bread from heaven, all the fathers of the church talk about manna was our Lord himself, and John 6 makes parallel between the manna, which doesn't give eternal life, and the bread of life, which is the Eucharist. Okay? So all, the mysteries of all of Holy Week are here being announced prophetically in this reading from the book of Exodus. The bread of heaven. But not only that, even it's almost as if the liturgical rites that we have of Holy Week are, are in detail foreseen by this uh, prophecy. Because on the sixth day, they're told, you can't just uh, collect enough. You, they were told, another parallel passage, don't take too much of the manna because it will rot anything you don't eat. So just take what you need for a day. But he said, but on the sixth day, you have to take a double portion because then it's Sabbath and you can't do any work. Right? You must collect a double portion of manna. On Holy Thursday, the priest consecrates two hosts. Because on Good Friday, the sacrifice is not offered. You have the beautiful altar repose. Then the Good Friday ceremony, the priest takes the host back to the high altar. So on Holy Thursday, he collects a double portion of manna, right? just like mentioned in the book of Exodus. The fountains, very significant because we have the blessing of the baptismal fount on Holy Saturday, which is one of the other principal moments of Holy Week. Um, the conclusion of this passage, in the evening you shall know that the Lord hath brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. Uh, this, so not only are the days of Holy Week connected to each other, but there are also these different connections from the different seasons of the year. So this passage at the end of the little epistle here forms the intro of the Christmas Vigil Mass, right? Uh, in the use of scripture, there's something called accommodation, where you use inspired words that come from God, applied in an edifying way to a different context. So obviously, here in the book of Exodus, we're not talking about Christmas, but on the morning of Christmas Eve, we're talking about how in the evening, you know, we've already celebrated Vespers, Christmas will have begun, in the morning we'll see the glory of God. Even more strictly does it apply to the liturgy of Holy Week. So, in the evening, Vespere, in the evening you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. The end of the Easter Vigil, the Mass, right, Vespers is glued on, right, because... Uh, by the time you get to the end of the Holy Saturday ceremonies, right, uh, which began after the Alphas of Known, but then you had the Exultet, you had 12 prophecies, you had Blessing of Font, you had Baptisms, a long time has passed. So it's after when Vespers would normally be. So there's sort of mini Vespers attached to the end of Easter Vigil. Instead of the Communion Antiphon that would normally be sung, you have Quickie Vespers, one psalm, but then the Magnificat, which is always the high point of Vespers. And the Magnificat Antiphon, Vesperi Altem, right, in the evening. It talks about, uh, let's see if I can fast forward here to the. Uh, end of the Easter Vigil, to quote to you directly the Magnificat Antiphon for the end of the Vespers slash Mass, Holy Saturday. It says, yes. Vespere autem sabbate que luceshit in prima sabbati. In the evening of the Sabbath, which dawns on the first day of the week, he made Magdalen and the other Mary to see, to see the sepulchre. And then they knew that the Lord had entered the Promised Land. So you have the end of this prophecy from Exodus, that in the evening you will know that the Lord has set you free. Holy Saturday, the end of the Easter Vigil. Evening comes, Mary Magdalene and the other whole room know the Lord has been set free. And it says, in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. In the gospel of Easter Sunday morning, it talks about Mane, that in the morning, right, they went and uh, to the tomb. So all of the ceremonies and the other days of the Holy Week are prophesied, indicated typologically, in other words, the Old Testament representing the New Testament, the shadow indicating the reality to the image for the reality. All of this is present in this epistle from the book of Exodus, right? To cut this from the liturgy on the grounds that it's it's useless, why does it make you look like a mass, it's completely pointless, it mentions a palm tree, all of Holy Week symbolically is foretold in that passage. It's extremely beautiful, that epistle, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about every part, Palm Sunday at such length, but that really is one of the keys. So on, Holy, on Palm Sunday when you come to mass and you listen to that, um, you'll know what it means. Then after that, uh, a gradual is sung, right? In it's not called it's not it's not actually a mass. So in the missal is called a responsory. It's not called a tract and a gradual. But there are two choices. One of them, colligerent, is about the conspiracy of the high priest against our Lord. It refers back to the gospel of the previous Friday. The other one, uh, in Monte Oliveti, is about our Lord's agony in the garden. That responsory is also used in the tenebrae of Holy Thursday. So it's again another link between the different ceremonies of Holy Week. Then we have the gospel. The gospel for the blessing of palms is the gospel I read to you a moment ago. It's St. Matthew's account. That itself you could reflect on 
uh, the symbolism here, St. Francis Sales has a beautiful sermon for Palm Sunday where he talks about the, the virtues of the donkey, why it is our Lord rode a donkey and not a horse, which is proud. So that's what's called the tropological meaning of a thing, the moral meaning, the example that you get from Scripture. But there's also an allegorical meaning. Fathers of the Church talk about how, first of all, the ass and the colt had to be unbound, right? So both peoples, the Jews and the Gentiles, were slaves to their sins. They had to be freed by the Lord. The ass represented the Jews, which had borne the burden of the law. It's a beast of burden. The colt on which no man had sat, it says in the Gospel, represents the Gentile peoples, because the Lord had not yet brought them the truth. And they're both included in Palm Sunday. Okay. Then we have another prayer. We have preface. Anything extremely important in the liturgy has to be blessed is blessed in the form of a solemn preface. You all know what the preface is like at Mass. The music of the preface, according to John Garanger, comes from the, the tune that they used to celebrate the triumph of ancient victors in, in ancient Greece. We all know the preface at Mass, but in all of the most solemn consecrations, there is a preface. So at the ordination of a priest or of a deacon, the consecration of a bishop, there's a preface. At the consecration of the font on Holy Saturday and Vigil of Pentecost, there's a preface. But the blessing of palms is the only blessing... Uh, which takes the form of a dry mass. And it's the only time in which a preface is followed by the sanctus like it is at mass. And these other prefaces that you have during the liturgical year to bless very important items, um, the Ash Wednesday, the Candlemas, they don't have a preface. Right? It's not as solemn a blessing. But none of these other blessings is followed by a sanctus. Now, probably the reason there's a sanctus here is because after the sanctus you have the benedictus, those words that come to us from Palm Sunday, right? Blessed he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So how could you have Palm Sunday not include these words? But they are introduced by the sanctus. So you have the preface, the sanctus, the benedictus, you have another prayer. I wish I could read you all these prayers because you should read them. Five prayers for the blessing of palms. They talk, again, about the ancient typology. So they mention Moses. They mention Noah. Uh, they talk about blessing the palm branches, blessing the olive trees as well, because in the Mediterranean, probably in Rome, and also in the Holy Land, they blessed olives as well, but that's a symbolism of the oil. Um, it refers also to other trees, and so in the north of the Alps, people don't really have palms or olive trees, so they bless whatever they could get. Um, but symbolically, those other things are palms and olive trees. And the symbolism of those things is still present. Uh, you, know, you can't read all these things. I keep you here all night. But in some of these prayers, these rituals are referred to as a sacramentum, right? the sign of a sacred thing. Uh, the seven sacraments that we have, these seven outward causes of grace, they were all instituted by our Lord. But the theology of an understanding what is a sacrament, what is the, all the elements of sacrament, how is the sign of a sacrament adequately represented, theology explained these things and took centuries of detail. Uh, the list of seven sacraments we have now with that word sacrament, word sacrament attached to them comes from the theology of the 13th century. In the early church and the fathers, and that's how old these prayers are, sacramentum has a much more, a, a, a branch in Palm Sunday is not a sacrament, right, as we would think of it now. But it is a sacramentum, it's a sign of a holy thing. And these words are used in these prayers. It's from patristic time when this word had a more a more general sense okay people receive their palms or they kiss first the palm then the hand of the priest so when receiving a blessed item like a candle must also you kiss first the object because it's just been blessed then the priest's hand so this is sort of like receiving communion then there's another prayer it's like the post communion and they said the deacon announces the procession let us go forth in peace in the name of christ amen right. so we have the procession I won't say too much about the procession itself, except to note that in the Roman liturgy, a procession before Mass, right, something that's preparing us for Mass, is always a penitential act, right? Especially, like, in the day when this is all developing and you're going miles and miles over hills in Judea with no shoes on, things probably was quite penitential. But in the Roman rite, processions are always, when they're before Mass, penitential, which is why violet is always the color used. So Candlemas, even though the Mass afterwards is in white, Rogation Masses... Uh, Palm Sunday is in violet. Um, in the Reformed Rite from the 50s, it's in red because they have this more triumphal. It never happens in the, history, in the Roman Rite that you go from having a triumphant uh, procession to a penitential Mass. Right? It's very bizarre. You can have a triumphant procession after a Mass, like in Corpus Christi, right? which is in white just like the Mass itself is. But since the idea of this change of vestments from red to, to violet, completely unprecedented in the history of the Roman Rite. So the, the procession is a penitential act. There are beautiful chants prescribed for the procession. We don't have time to talk about that. But what is very important is when we get back to church. So we no longer have this 
original first mass leaving from one church going to another. In some places, they did still keep the custom of blessing the palms at one church or at a chapel outside the city gates and then going to the cathedral or wherever, so that's still possible. But most places, the palms are blessed at the altar of the church, and you leave that church and come back to it. But it's a procession that has a purpose, um, which is to get back to the church. Um, but it's sort of a purpose that is sort of self-imposed because we're just going to come back to where we came from. It's not like a um, procession of the altar repose where we have to get there to put the Blessed Sacrament there. But we have this procession, then what happens? We go back into church. Yes, but not right away. We're locked out. Right? Somebody, not an accident. Very deliberately that we are locked out of church. The station at the church door. So several members of the choir will have gone into church. Now, sometimes in the Middle Ages... They would erect a temporary gallery or loft above the church doors so you could hear the chorister from easily. Some of the medieval churches didn't have this built in as a permanent structure, uh, or they'd be sort of like behind a window up in the choir loft looking down on you. Um, but in any case, you have part of the choir inside, the rest of the choir, and people outside. And they sing back and forth this beautiful uh, hymn, which is one of the jewels of, of Roman chant, the Gloria Laus, a hymn to the kingship of Christ, composed by St. Theodulf who in the ninth century was the Bishop of Orléans in France. I don't know all the politics here, but he, he didn't make the king too happy, Louis the Debonair. He was put in prison. And on Palm Sunday, he had composed this new hymn. And as the procession was going by his prison window, he was singing it. And the emperor said, that's a pretty nice song. OK, you can come out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the hymn. So it's a hymn. From, it's, uh, what, 1,100 years old, 1,200 years old. Uh, we sing it back and forth through the doors. Why, why do we do that? Okay, this is, again, symbolism. And there can be multiple levels of symbolism. The church as a building symbolizes the holy city of Jerusalem, which is a historical past reality. It symbolizes the Christian soul. It symbolizes the holy body of our Lord himself. It symbolizes the heavenly Jerusalem. So there are many different levels of symbolism. Where outside, the doors are shut, because the doors are shut by sin. So they're inside. They're the angels. But the church triumphant and the church militant join in the same adoration of God through Christ. So we sing back and forth through the doors, us and the angels, church triumphant, the church militant. Eventually, at the end of the hymn, the subdeacon bangs on the door with the cross, and the doors can open. Okay, so the door is important, the cross is important, and the action is important. In a church, it's not just a church because it looks nice, right? What makes a church a church is not statues and stations of the cross and it's beautifully decorated. It's the fact that it's set apart for divine worship. Right? And so the church building is a sacred place. Uh, and so the threshold is a very important part of the church because it's that part of separation of the world and then the sacred place. Once you get into the church, you sort of recalibrate, and then you have different divisions within the church. The narthex or the vestibule represents the fallen world. The nave where the people sit is the redeemed world, i.e. the church militant, and the sanctuary is heaven, the church triangle. Well, we're still outside. Outside is the fallen world, and the whole church is the redeemed world or the glorified world. The cross is what's going to open the door. Right? Heaven was closed to mankind because of sin. Only the cross of Christ can open the door. So again, this is not just you know somebody one year back in Gaul accidentally locked the church, and so they had to tell the section of the men, so the subject decided to knock on the door at the foot of the cross. No, it's a symbolic meaning. We can only get into heaven through the cross of Christ. The cross is still veiled, right? Now, sometimes in some of these more florid medieval ceremonies, they would unveil the cross. There would be a sort of ceremony of a genuflect to the cross. And they might have its own logic. But in the, in the Roman rite, the cross is still veiled, first of all, because it's passion type. The images are veiled until Good Friday when you unveil the crosses. But the mystery of the cross is hidden, right? And our Lord, as he approached the Holy City on his first Palm Sunday, he sat and wept. He said, because these things have been hidden from your eyes. Right? St. Paul says that, cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. So this mystery, St. Paul says, the mystery hidden from all eternity, which has the power to save us, is also hidden from our eyes, right, until we've been uh, enlightened by faith. So the cross is still veiled. The door of a church, again, incredibly important. When a church is consecrated by the bishop at full ceremonial, the door is one of those places that receives a great deal of attention. He takes his crozier and inscribes a cross on the threshold. He marks the post of the door with chrism. And as he's asking for admittance to the church, he says these words of Psalm 22, uh, open, ye princes, these gates, right? uh, which is also a psalm of the ascension. <coughs> the next point, that one action can represent more than one reality in the liturgy, that not only does the liturgy of Palm Sunday anticipate all the mysteries of Holy Week, but the whole, it's called Pasch the Paschal Mystery, 
the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord, which is referred to in two of the prayers of the Mass, these three mysteries together. Our Lord entering, so us entering the church reminds us of our Lord entering Jerusalem, and both of those things remind us of our Lord's triumphant entrance into heaven. Right? It's the church building, it's the earthly Jerusalem, it's the church on earth, it's also the heavenly Jerusalem. And so the cross of Christ has redeemed us, peace has been made, the doors are open, our Lord ascends in glory into heaven, the people follow behind, and so now the angels and men who have been redeemed are united. At the end of the apocalypse, when St. John falls down in adoration to the angel who's speaking to him, uh, the angel says, now I lost that piece of paper, but he says, do not do that because we are fellow, we are fellows, right? fellow workers, uh, because now men and angels are united in the church triumphant. So this entrance to the church for Palm Sunday represents, the redemption represents the ascension, which is the crowning of our Lord's work of redemption. Then we have the Mass of Palm Sunday. The Mass of Palm Sunday, um, the intro comes from Psalm 21, which I'm going to say more about in a moment. The epistle is from St. Paul to the Philippians uh, that we genuflect. Uh, it's, this is the epistle where St. Paul, Paul talks about the, the double humiliation of our Lord. In fact, the incarnation itself is, as it were, a divine condescension that God enters our, our world. And then, when he's in this world, how does it welcome him? By crucifying him. So it's this double uh, condescension of God and his goodness, but because of which he has been exalted. And so at that moment, we all genuflect in the epistles read. Then you have a tract before the singing of the gospel. Now, the general character of this Mass of Palm Sunday, it's more or less like, quote-unquote, a normal Mass, uh, except there's the singing of the Passion, which is different. We have that also on Holy Tuesday and Holy Wednesday, with particular rubrics that govern the singing of the Passion. So it's a normal Mass, right? It's not like Good Friday, it's not like the Easter Vigil, which is very, very different in many ways. A normal Mass whose character, nonetheless, is marked by the time of year it's happening. And so there's sort of, as we enter, imagine you're in a, temple of Jerusalem, you enter the holy city from the outside world, and you enter the court of the Gentiles, and the court of Israel, the Hebrew men could pray, then the priests and Levites go to the holy place, and then only the high priest goes to the holy of holies. That's a sacred gradation in space. The liturgical year has a sort of sacred gradation also in time, and so as we approach the holy of holies of our redemption, we have multiple preparations. You don't go from the last day of Christmas and the next day is Easter. You have Septuagesima, you have Lent, Passion Tide, and you have the Triduum, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil. So the accumulation of liturgical signs marks the normal Mass of Palm Sunday. So it's already happened at Trugesima, so the, the Book of Vestments, we no longer have the Holy Word, Alleluia. Lent has happened, so our ears are already fasting, the organ isn't played, right? Uh, it's Passion Tide, so our eyes are also fasting, all the images have been hidden. Uh, our Lord's abasement is much more thought of in the, in the liturgy. It's not just the theme of preparing for baptism or doing penance. That continues, but in Passion Tide, we're thinking more and more of our Lord and his sufferings. So the psalm, Judica May, is no longer set at the foot of the altar, for example. The Gloria Patri is not set at the Asperges, so that's how Palm Sunday is like Passion Sunday, but different than every Sunday of the year. Uh, when the priest washes his hands, there's no Gloria Patri at the lavabo, there's no Gloria Patri in the introit. But our, our Lord's glory is being taken bit by bit by, by those who are conspiring against him. So that's to address the Lent Passion type, this sentiment is just, as I said, um, becoming much more pronounced until you get all the way to the Triduum itself when even at the end of the Psalms of the Divine Office there's no Gloria Patri, right? The, the Godhead has been so outraged by the sins of man and the Passion, the, the deicide, the fundamental, the, the archetypal act of ingratitude of the fallen man towards its creator. Um, but we're not there yet, right, on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, we're, we've been through some first Lent and Passion Tide, so we have all those signs that are present in this Mass. We have this tract, this long tract, Psalm 21. I'll read it to you because we are almost done, right? Is that okay? You can leave if you want to. Psalm 21. Now, usually in the gradual of Mass, we have a little snippet of a psalm, right? Who remembers the first Sunday of Lent? It was long, right? You have all of Psalm 90 sung as the tract. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes. Depends on how zippy the choir is, I suppose, right? It takes a long time. Uh, because the devil misquoted that psalm, so the church is throwing the whole thing back in the face of the devil. In Psalm 21, we have this tract, Palm Sunday, the same idea, reciting this whole psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Far from my salvation are the words of my sins. O oh my God, I shall cry by day, and thou wilt not hear, and by night, and it shall not be reputed as folly in me. But thou dwellest in the holy place, the praise of Israel. In thee have our fathers hoped. They have hoped, and they have delivered them. Thou hast delivered them. They cried to thee, and they were saved. Thou trusted in thee, and we're not confounded, but I am a worm and no man. I am the reproach of men 
and the outcast of the people. All they that saw me have laughed me to scorn. They have spoken with lips and wagged the head. Right? Think of the scene of the Passion. This is what's happening at the foot of the cross. Right? They're spitting at him, they're insulting him, they're shaking their head, which is a gesture of a pilgrimage culture. It's sort of like using a particular digit today, but it was a gesture of extreme disgrace. The Psalms predicting this. He hoped in the Lord, let him deliver him. This is what they're saying at the foot of the cross. Let him save him, seeing that he delights in him. But they have looked and stared upon me. They parted my garments amongst them, and upon my vesture they have cast lots. Deliver me from the lion's mouth and my lowness from the horns of the unicorns. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. They shall, There shall be declared to the Lord a generation to come, and the heavens shall show forth his justice to a people that shall be born which the Lord hath made. Right. So that's more or less the whole psalm. Like psalm 90 was more or less the whole psalm in the tract on the first Sunday of Lent. So this is important also to understand why our Lord says these words on the cross. It's not a sign of desperation, right? Uh, the ancient Hebrews, ancient people in general, were extremely oral culture. Uh, not only did it, it was not primarily a book culture, but it certainly was not an iPad culture. They had long memories, and you memorize things better by, so if it's poetry like a psalm and by singing it. And so it's called the incipit. When you say the first name or the first line of a piece of literature, it calls to mind the rest of it. So our Lord, since he not only was a pious Hebrew who had a good memory, but since he inspired the Bible, he certainly knew what came next. And you can see that it's not a psalm of desperation. It ends with the just man being vindicated by God. And it's also a prophecy of the Passion. So it doesn't quote every single verse of this. One of the most striking verses, in fact, in Psalm 21 is, They have pierced my hands and my feet, um, which is a very clear prediction of pro uh, prophecy of the Passion. In the Hebrew Psalter that exists now, it's called the Masoretic Text. Um, Hebrew was not written originally with vowels, and so the, the oral tradition to be transmitted in writing, the rabbis developed a system of little marks to show how the words pronounce which vowels go in which words. The Masoretic Text is from centuries after the time of our Lord. Right? Some of it is medieval. It's not the original Hebrew text, or there is no original Hebrew text. In the Masoretic Text, they have pierced my hands and my feet was rewritten with just a little squiggle to my hands and my feet are like lions, which is completely meaningless, but it's obviously to blunt the Christian force of that prophecy, right? Um, so the Masoretic text in many points hides prophecies, like that veiled cross, right? And St. Paul says that to this day the Jews, when they read Moses, they have a veil over their hearts, right? And the prayer of Good Friday talks about the veil being lifted. That's what we pray for. Uh, because Christ alone is the key who can not only open the New Testament, but also the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament is a shadow, indicates the image which leads us to the reality. And St. Justin the Martyr, already in the early 2nd century, uh, in his book, or it's now a book, Dialogue with Trifor the Jew, who's a rabbi, he reproaches the Jews already at that time for having changed texts of the Old Testament to make them less obviously Christian. The Old Testament is a Christian book. So that's Psalm 21, that particular line is, it is not quoted in this, but it's very important to understand Psalm 21 is not desperate. It's the church wants us already to hear all of this on Palm Sunday, to lead us to the passion that's about to be sung, our Lord did not despair. Remember, our Lord's human nature is not an optical illusion. It was the instrument of his divinity for our redemption. And he, he pushed it to its breaking point in that a human nature, right, a body, if you don't feed it, it gets hungry. If it exercises a lot, it gets tired. Right? He asked the woman at the well for water. He fell asleep on the boat because he was tired. Uh, and also, uh, a human nature has passions, has emotions. Uh, a normal human being does not like to know about his own impending death. He doesn't like to have all his friends abandon him. That's a terrible thing. And so our Lord, in his lower nature, right, his, his physical nature, his emotions, he experienced everything those faculties can experience when they're pushed to their breaking point. The inner sanctum of his soul, as for all of our souls, is our intellect and will, which nobody but God and us has access to. And our Lord, knowing this psalm by heart, knows that it ends well for the just man who's faithful to God. He didn't despair on the cross, but all of the consolations were taken away from him. That's true. And that epistle from St. Paul, uh, this emptying of Christ in the Incarnation and the Passion, in Greek it's called kenosis, that has given rise to some false theories of modernist theologians that our Lord in the Passion uh, either was separated from the divinity or that he lost the beatific vision. That's not true. That's, that's blasphemous. It's simply that he didn't use the privileges of the divinity to shield his human nature from the trauma of the passion, sort of like an extremely tall mountain uh, that could have its foothills under stormy clouds, but the summit is still basking in daylight. So our Lord's lower nature was suffering in the way that was natural for it, but in his heart, in his soul, he, he was still perfectly united to the Godhead, and he had to be a vision in his soul, even in the midst of the passion. Okay? Then we have the singing of the passion. 
that's really the distinctive thing about the Mass of Palm Sunday. St. Matthew's Passion on Palm Sunday, it's the longest of the four Passions. And in the unreformed version of the Holy Week, uh, it begins with the Last Supper, even before the Last Supper with the um, anointing of our Lord's feet in view of his Passion. Right? Um, in the reform, they cut the Last Supper from the accounts of the Passion that are sung in Holy Week. And in that case, that means that the account of the Last Supper is never read any day of the entire liturgical year. In the, not in the Novus Ordo, 1962 Missal. Never do you read the account of the Last Supper, except at the votive Mass of the Blessed Sacrament. That's a bit strange. The idea is, yeah, it is long, especially when it's sung, chanted in full, which uh, we didn't do last year because we didn't have three deacons, and we may not be able to do it again this year. In that case, the priest simply reads it out loud, except for the last part, which the deacon sings as the Gospel of the day. Extremely long, takes about half an hour when it's sung, but you cannot separate the mystery of the Last Supper, the Eucharist, from the Passion. These three things, the Last Supper, the Passion, the Mass, are intrinsically related to each other. And we've seen this before, since we've come to some theology classes. The Mass, the day of the Last Supper, the day of the Mass. The Mass is not a reenactment of the Last Supper, no. You have to add a third thing here, which is the passion around it. That act of all by which he accomplished redemption. The Mass is the sacramental renewal of the passion. The Last Supper anticipated the sacrifice which our Lord would offer the next day and which is renewed in the Mass. But the Last Supper and the Mass both look towards the passion. The Last Supper looks towards the passion, the Mass renews the passion. So you can't separate it. So Again, this is an inexcusable thing. Yeah, sure, it's shorter, but what are you going to What, you're going to just go home and you take an extra 10 minutes in your nap? It's Palm Sunday. It's once a year. You need to hear the account of the Last Supper joined to the account of the Passion. At the end of the reading or the singing of the Passion, we genuflect towards the end at the moment when our Lord's soul leaves his body in an act of adoration. In the Middle Ages, sometimes they would prostrate and even kiss the floor. Um, then there's another few lines before the end of that gospel. And then there's the final part, the gospel of the day, which is the burial of our Lord. And whether the passion was sung by three deacons or whether it was simply read out of by the priest, this last part is sung as the gospel of the day. On Palm Sunday, we incense the book as usual. On Good Friday, at this corresponding moment, there won't be incense because it's, it's, everything is stripped away. On Palm Sunday, at this part, the Gospel of the Mass, uh, the acolytes don't carry candles, but they do carry palms, and indeed everybody in church carries palms for the Passion and for this Gospel at the end. After the main part of the Passion has been finished, before the Gospel, the priest would go and say the Permunda Cormeum to purify his lips as he would any other day of the year before reading the Gospel. There's an awkward little pause, because normally at solemn Mass, the priest is reading the Gospel, the deacon is about to sing while the gradual is being sung, and other sorts of things going on, there's no dead time. This is just, on um, Palm Sunday, it's very awkward. There's this bizarre gap, there's no music. You're just waiting for the priest to quietly read the gospel while the deacon's getting ready to sing it. The world, having now seen the death of its redeemer, is, is in shock. It doesn't know how to process it. There's, there's just a time in which time does not flow anymore. Then the deacon will sing the final count, the passion, uh, the burial of our Lord. There's a very beautiful tone of music called the haunting tone or the weeping tone. Um, you may have heard it. If you've heard it here before, you've heard it sung poorly by me, so you might not know what it's supposed to sound like. But it's extremely mournful and haunting. It's, it's again, one of these pieces of music that you only hear during Holy Week uh, that, that it give, it contributes to the whole feeling of these ceremonies. Uh, so as I said, that the Passion in this Gospel, that's the unique feature of the Mass of Palm Sunday after that Mass ends as, as usual. Um, that is an overview of Palm Sunday. I know that's already been very long. It's not been as long as the Mass will be on Sunday. I can assure you of that. <laughs> but one could say much more. You know, I said to one of my conferences earlier today, uh, you know, these talks, I, I like giving them, but in some ways it's frustrating because you know that if you just sat there and opened the Missal because they're rich and, and talked to the people about it, that would already be hopefully nourishing for them. But as, as you're preparing it, you want to read everything you can find out about it, meditate on all these passages. And you could, not, not that I could, but one could talk for hours about all these things. That's just the first day of Holy Week. It's every day of Holy Week. But as I said, Palm Sunday is extremely important because it's it's the opening act of all of Holy Week, and it contains the rest of Holy Week already in germ inside of it. Um, so don't come to the low mass on Sunday, please. Come to the solemn mass on Sunday. You're allowed to come to the low mass. It's fine. It's still, it doesn't make you a bad Catholic. But none of this will make sense about the low mass. That's all I'm saying. The palms are only blessed for the... Again, there's no quickie blessing of palms. 
If you want palms, come to the high mass, or they'll be available in the basket until they run out, so you can pick them up later. But I can't come in before the low mass and say, like, make up my own quickie version of blessing palms, just because you want to take home a souvenir. That's not, that's not how it works. You can't mutilate the liturgy. If there is a low mass on Palm Sunday, or for example, the monastery where all the priests are saying a private mass, uh, the gospel at the end of mass, instead of St. John's gospel, it would, be, it would be this gospel from the blessing of palms. You know, like the proper last gospel we have on a Sunday when there's a feast day. Uh, at all private masses and all low masses on Palm Sunday, at the end of masses, read this gospel from the Blessing of Palms instead of the normal last gospel. Okay. Any questions? Yes. It, uh, with with the, the dry mass related to the blessing of, of the palm, is, is the proper way to view blessed palm as, as a, an extraordinarily set? Sac super sacramental, for lack of a better well, word. For lack of a better word, yes, because there is not technically a category of super sacramentals. Uh, sometimes there are what are called the three great liturgical blessings of ashes on Ash Wednesday, candles and candlemas, and palms on Palm Sunday, uh, because they're supposed to be performed in every church during the liturgical year, for example, uh, whereas the blessing of the font is only done in cathedrals and parish churches. So these are the three great blessings that are an intrinsic part of the liturgical year that must be held. So yes, the blessed palms are extremely powerful, and important should be dealt with reverently. And some of these prayers, of course, we didn't have time to go through all of them, but if you read in your missal the actual prayers for the blessing of palms, it talks about them, about how they should be taken home devoutly. Um, I've heard even that during storms and calamities, when there are penitential processions to beg for God's mercy, that sometimes palms are chopped up and added to the incense for these processions. Um, and as you know, these palms then become the ashes on Ash Wednesday, right? which is itself a very meaningful, let's, thus passes the glory of the world. Turn, that which was glorious now turns to, to ash. So it is a sort of super sacramental, but that's, again, that's not an official word. Right? It's not a, an official designation. How, how does the removal of the um, Judicum A from the beginning of Mass indicate a, you use the word, increased humility or a sort of lacking? Yes, because if you read that psalm, it talks about the joy right, that, that comes from approaching the altar. And so this is, again, a, a progressive condescension or stripping away of, of the glory that God is receiving not, not not now in the church he's receiving an object of glory from the liturgy and again remember beauty has proportion so if every day looked like Easter or Christmas that would in itself be very beautiful right I think everyone would agree that the church on Easter Sunday morning is more beautiful than after the service on Good Friday but if every day were like that then the whole year would not be beautiful so our, our Lord receives glory from the ensemble right? it's not he's not being dishonored because we're not saying this on Utica May but it reflect it reflects historically the state of soul and basement that our Lord experienced. Yes? So, Ken, I'm trying to participate as a lesser to a greater mind. Why are you so enthusiastic about the dry mass specifically on, on Palm Sunday? So can I think about it as a preview? As sort of like yes. A, as a, as a, a book, not even a book, not a book, as an like anticipatory, um, it's, a, it's a summary essentially of what we're about Absolutely, to it is a summary week. anticipation of all the mysteries of Holy Week. Right. Right. And throughout the church, there are a lot of these sort of bookend things where one thing refers to another. So, for example, at Septuagesima, which was the beginning of this whole process, uh, we had to set aside the Alleluia. Right? How can we sing the song of the Lord in a strange land? And that's not really 70 days before Easter, even though it's the symbolism of Septuagesima is based on the number 70, like for Lent it's number 40. That's because Lent is called Quadragesima 40, and you just count back around to Quinquagesima, Septuagesima. However, Septuagesima is literally 70 days from low Saturday, the last day of the octave of Easter, where the intro talks about how the Lord has brought us out of slavery and brought us into the promised land. So that's sort of a bookend. Um, Easter is not just Easter day, but the prayer stop at the, the Solemnia Pascalia or the Festa Pascalia, the end of the Easter week is the end of the first phase of Easter. That's really when Easter ends. It's not just after Mass and Easter Sunday. So that's sort of a bookend from Septuagesima to low Saturday. So there has to be a consecration if it's a Mass. In this case, it's a consecration so in this case, it's a palm instead of being consecrated rather Correct. than an actual consecration. Correct. And that consecration of Eucharist is consecration with a capital C, for lack of a better term, but liturgically and theologically, we do often use the word consecration for a particularly solemn blessing. The bishop is consecrated, for example. Um, yes? Is there anything different about Easter Tuesday and Easter Wednesday except for Passion being said? So I think you mean uh, Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday, because Sorry. Easter Sorry, Tuesday is during yeah, Easter week. Uh, so Holy Tuesday which is sometimes called Temple Tuesday. So in English, so in the Missal, there are uh, the names, you know, the Monday of Holy Week, for example. Um, in English, we have Palm Sunday, 
Fig Monday, Temple Tuesday, Spy Wednesday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday. So it's very inter English is much more interesting language than a lot of French or some of these other languages. But on the Tuesday of Holy Week, it's a, a completely normal Mass, except that we have the Passion of St. Mark. The Wednesday of Holy Week is a completely normal Mass, but there is a, an additional first reading, as you have some, some other days went as well, and then you have the Passion of St. Luke. So those two days, and Monday is, is really just a normal Passion-type Mass. Uh, and, but then Holy Thursday, very, very unique. Good Friday, very unique. But I said, we'll talk about that next year. So <laughs> I want to keep you here till next year. Because... <laughs> yes? You, yes. I just had a, a question. St. Andrew's of Nestle, I think, just does a tremendous job on yes. the liturgical, historical, yes. and doctrinal, giving an explanation. And my wife said she'd kill me if I bring, brought home another book that I wouldn't read. So I didn't buy that when it was back then. It was sold out. Do you have, if you were to make a uh, kind of a critique of that versus that book and then the liturgical year by Guéranger or others, do you do you have a preference? Well, I don't have a wife who tells me not to bring home books, so <laughs> <laughs> so I have all of them. <laughs> and you can too. I won't tell her. But... <laughs> no, they're, they're, all, they're all very good, but again, some of these, some of these very good books, um, even in some of the commentaries, like, never I guess be... to add a little bit of more right. question, is when, when you read some of the the epistles during yes. Passion Week uh, and, and throughout Lent, sometimes you just want a good source afterwards when you go right. to a daily mass to try to learn a little bit more about it. And right. I was just wondering. Well, if you as you know, it. as you know, for example, the St. Andrew's Daily Missal is a one-volume missal for the whole year. This is one-volume book just for Holy Week. Um, non guarantee it's fifteen volumes, so it also depends how much you want. Yeah. But the St. Andrew's Daily Missal is extremely. Uh, if you could take. If you had to move to a desert island or a, or a FEMA camp or something, you could only have a few books. You have the Roman Catechism, the St. Andrew's Daily Missal, the Introduction to the Devout Life. You know, you'll be in good shape if you could just read and reread these these few books. And the Missal, not only the Prayer's Missal, but the Commentary of St. Andrew's Daily Missal are very, very good. Um, but again, even some of these books from the first half of the 20th century, sometimes they had suppositions built in that were innocent but that are not necessarily true. Like, so for example, a lot of these books, even this one, even though we sold it, when they talk about the Easter Vigil, uh, some of them have bought into this idea, which is now discredited, that the Easter Vigil is really uh, being celebrated 20 hours too early or whatever, whereas really it is a vigil, it's a day of preparation, it's not a midnight mass of Easter or something like that. So I think Father Fortescue, um, in his holy book, he says, you know, when we attend the Easter Vigil, the church asks us to imagine that it's really nighttime, which actually, it's not really the case. So no book is perfect, except the Bible, obviously. Okay, you've all been patient. Thank you. Thank you. So come, come, bring friends. But again, and part part of the point of the liturgical year, why we have a liturgical cycle and why it's not A, B, C, and different every year, is that you don't have to get it all at once, right? And also, since the purpose is the glory of God, right, and the liturgy. It's, again, it's not theatrical, it's not formalism, ritualism. It gives glory to God by eliciting in us acts of faith, hope, and charity. Some people are holier than others. Some people might understand some things more than others, have insights other people don't have. There's probably some very holy nun in this monastery who, you know, this note from the very enchant that she sung 18 times has now hit her way it didn't last year, and that hasn't yet hit some other nun. But the ensemble of the church militant celebrating the church every year gives a lot of glory to God because everybody is getting something from liturgy, and the holiness in their soul is now giving glory to God. And so... It might be the case that a secular priest gets more out of the holy ceremonies in the church we have than a random layperson, but and also that some monk or nun is getting more than a secular priest because their whole life is not just reading the breviary but singing the office because the office is not dead letters, it's meant to be sung. Uh, but every year we can enter in more deeply. And the fact that it's the same every year, but you're not the same every year, right? So that's you don't have to walk home today and, and pretend that you could explain all of Palm Sunday to everyone or that when you come this Sunday, you're going to get it and everything's going to click. Every year, you're going to get it more and more, and then plus God's grace and the Holy Spirit are working behind the scenes um, to activate your soul as it comes into contact with this objective reality that is the living.